Really wanted to touch on tree stand setup and a little bit of safety too. We always try to throw that in there, especially when it comes to tree stands. I'm always worried about that with you viewers, readers, um, clients that we see uh, personally and get to know them personally. Uh, it's always something that's really critical. So I wanted to touch on some of the basics uh, when it comes to setting up a tree stand. And really, when you look back um, in taking shots, you should spook very, very few deer when it comes to pulling your bow back and getting the shot off. The hardest part should be getting the deer in front of you, not when you take a shot. And in fact, what I find is on 50 shot attempts, I might spook a deer. It doesn't happen very often at all. And there's ways you can set that up to make sure that happens. If you're spooking deer every one out of five times, 10 times, 20 times you pull back, there's something different that needs to change. And we're gonna talk about that too. First off, we're talking about, I, I think my shot down there is going to be, we actually have a water hole here and in a, in a, in a uh, trail and mock scrape. I think that shot's gonna be around 25 to 26 yards, 27 yards. I actually like that. That position that we're gonna be shooting down there is about seven or eight feet below the tree stand. So we're actually shooting at even a steeper angle. What's important about that is I can aim 20 yards and with that steep angle, I'm accounting for about two to three yards of loss and drop in inches of the uh, arrow. So if you look at the arrow's gonna drop two, three inches, I'm shooting a steep angle. What happens when we panic for a shot and a, and a nice buck comes in, a deer that you wanna shoot, doe, whatever it is, you start to get a little bit of buck fever and you just take your 20 yard pin and you shoot. And let's face it, a lot of times, you know, if you're using a single pin, if I'm shooting right down there at that spot, that's great. What happens if it's right over here? What happens if it's 35 yards? You can't shoot one pin. You know how someone, tells you that they don't, they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to archery, you can discount anybody that says, I use one pin out to 40 yards and the bow is flat. Now, if you're aiming 40 yards compared to 25 yards and using your 25 yard pin, you're going to have to aim anywhere from, depending how fast your bow is, anywhere from 10 to 15 inches high. There's going to be that much drop in that, that arrow. But I like setting up at that 26, 27 yard because if I hurry a shot and I'm shooting a 20 yard pin, I'm gonna say aim center long and I'm accounting for hitting just above the heart and that's that perfect sweet spot. What happens around here is if that arrow, if that deer ducks a little bit and it's a steep angled shot at 20 yards, you're going to hit the shoulder almost every single time. And it doesn't matter how heavy your arrow is, what kind of broadhead you is, you can't count on breaking through that shoulder bone, but just a handful, a small percentage of the time that you actually shoot that deer in the shoulder. Goes through the blade, you could probably go through most shoulder blades, the actual flat part with a field point. That doesn't happen with a broadhead when you're shooting the actual bone, the actual ridge of that shoulder bone or right on the socket. It doesn't go through there, no matter what t anybody tells you online. So you have to really look at those, those features. But first of all, I have that shot right down there, so I wanna be facing you at the camera. I'm right-handed. I can sit and shoot and I can just pull back aim straight at that spot. I don't want to stand and take a shot. And we're going to show you up in the tree stand what that looks like here in a little bit. But most importantly, I'm looking ahead. I'm saying, okay, I'm going to pick this tree. My shot's over here. I want my stand facing this way. So I, I rarely have to stand up to shoot unless it's in an unplanned for position, which does happen to my right, behind me, to my side. But from a seated position, I can shoot this way on this side of the camera, shoot back this way. And I can shoot all the way back here from a seat. I can shoot 180 degrees. Ask yourself, yourself, are most of your trails within 180 degrees? Can you sit with your back to the tree and shoot 180 degrees just simply by pulling back straight at the deer and making very little movement? That's how you keep from spooking deer. If you have to stand up, if you have to switch and shoot on the other side of the tree, it's gonna be very difficult to actually effectively shoot deer. And again, the hard part shouldn't be shooting the deer. It is some years. I know I've had a couple bad years, uh, 2020, 2010, come to mind as really some major mishaps when it come, came to bow hunting. But bottom line is, the hard part should be getting the deer in front of you, especially the target buck you're after. If you're after target bucks, if you're after any deer, whatever it is, that's gonna be a difficult part. We step back to here. We look at a tree like this. One of the things I like to use are high quality tree stands. So in this case right here, Dylan can show you later, we actually bend this ladder right here from Family Traditions to the contour of the tree. I'm not sure this is Jack Turner approved, the owner of Family Tradition Tree Stands, 
But because of this rolled USA steel, we can actually bend the ladder to the curve of the tree. You can't do that with that thin square steel tubing that you find at most big box stores when you buy a tree stand. This is important here, we didn't have any branches to clear when putting up this ladder, so it was a nice smooth shot. And then I'm typically using a hanger harness, which is over on the, there on the ground, I'll show you that in a little bit. I can put my buckles in there for my uh, ratchet straps. I can put my T-screw in that I'm gonna mount the stand on. And then I can put my saw in there too. So everything, my, my hands are hands-free. And then we have a rope around here that we can actually use to position ourselves so we don't have to use our hands to hold on the tree, just our feet right here. So that's really important. A hanger harness for setting up a stand is it's just beautiful. Works really well. Also, we're using a lifeline. And Dylan will have to show you that maybe later, but we're connecting that hanger harness or we're connecting our tree stand. Once we get it up, we're connecting right to this lifeline here so that we're connected as soon as we step foot off the ground, we're already connected. We connect right here and we go up. In our case right here, we have two of them. We have two of them on here because if we have a cameraman like Dylan, Dante, Gunner, then we're accounting for them too so they can stay safe right off of the ground. So the lifeline is critical for all stand. I don't, I don't encourage anybody to not use a safety harness, let alone not staying connected right when you get off the ground. That's one of the three major, you have ABCs of tree stand safety. Those are two right there. Staying connected when you get off the ground and using a, a hanger harness. Always, Always be connected, <laughs> doesn't really matter. Good. Yeah, that, that is, that's really good, Dylan. I wonder if they, Hunter Safety even knows that. I think that they're the ones who use it all the time. Now. Oh my. Yeah, don't don't tell anybody online, you guys, anybody that knows anything about tree stands or anything, Dylan's gonna use that now. So just keep it quiet. So we're going up, and this happens to be, it's a, boy, it's a 12, 14 inch oak tree down here, but up there it's pretty skinny. So pretty easy to step around to the front side. You get those bigger trees, bigger diameter, where you're starting to talk 16 to 20 inch diameter trees, then I'm typically gonna keep moving my stand and my access, my ladder will be, in fact, I'd rather be on this side, stepping over 90 degrees on a big tree than the way we have it right now on our skinnier tree that we can just easily step around. It gets really difficult to step 180 degrees around the tree. So that 90 degree rule, if you can do that, is always really easy for uh, tree stand setup. Now we're talking about the position here. We have our shot down there, which we plan for is around 26, 27 yards, 25 yards, depending on which side of the water hole they're on. It could even be 23, 24. We're in that sweet spot right there for a vertical bowl. That's what I like, like there. And it is a steep angle. Like I said, we're a little bit above elevation uh, from where our, we expect our shot to be down there. Now, when we're setting up a tree stand, of course, we're setting up the ladder. We have all our equipment in the hanger harness so that we can use hands-free. We have the rope around the tree. We're also making sure we have a mock scrape location. The water hole is not a priority. It depends on location on the property. We have one about every three stands or so on the property. Um, and that'll still hold out typically on a 40 acre parcel. It doesn't matter if it's 40 or 200. That's about usually the way it works because you have fewer stands per acre as the parcel size gets larger. But we have mock scrape, a tree for the camera, which we're gonna set up right now after we shoot this. And, and then the stand location. So all three of those together, mock scrape, camera, tree stand, not always a water hole. But I want a mock scrape at every stand location. I'm not trying to sell you something on those though. I'm not trying to sell you a certain kind of rope. I'm not trying to sell you a certain kind of scent. We use all natural and what I found after watching tens of thousands of scrapes and bucks coming into scrapes throughout many years, that that's the most attractive mock scrape. That you want a, an accumulation of deer on that brand, 20 deer, 25 deer, that rub their preorbital gland scent and deer can come through and they can smell all those deer. And they're pretty much just leaving their scent. We even have bucks that, after they leave their scent, move their head away from the licking branch so they don't bump into it. And I feel it's because they just left their scent, it's sacred to them, it's a form of communication. But we notice that behavior over and over again with big bucks, how they'll actually move their antlers around the licking branch that we have. And we put a vertical branch hanging right in the trail. And if you're interested in those mock scrapes, we have over 50 mock scrape videos in my mock scrape playlist on this channel. Check them out. They're all videos that we've created throughout the years for a long time 
and, uh, and they'll work for you. People use them all over the place. People call them a Sturgis mock vine scraper, vine scraper, licking branch, whatever it is. We use a vertical branch, never use rope, never use fake material. That's a bunch of hogwash. People are just trying to take your money from you and I don't want to be one of those people. You can imagine the sponsorships I turned down when it comes to scent and mock scrapes. Sponsorships I don't believe in, I don't believe they're good for you. And this is all free. You can just use them. I'm not trying to sell anything when it comes to that, but mock scrape, trail camera. Think about it when it comes to a tree stand. You're trying to get the shot. If a buck is coming in from 20 yards out, he's staring at that mock scrape, what's he not doing? He's not staring at you, and he's not staring at the trail camera. So it works in a couple different ways. Put a new hunter with a mock scrape, they're gonna get a higher percentage of shots off. We all have a fail rate when it comes to getting the shot off, even making the shot. I think fine, that's, I can get the shot off without spooking the deer. It's making the shot sometimes, making the correct shot that, uh, that I falter on. And we all have a fail rate though. I have a fail rate, a new hunter has a fail rate. Hopefully that new hunter has a, hopefully they're really good at it. But bottom line is, the, we all have fail rates. So we're trying to set things up so you don't fail. A lot of tree stand setups, you're gonna fail right from the beginning. And while we're at it, we're already over 10 minutes into this video. Um, I know that because Dylan gives me the 10 minute warning sign to the, like, try to wrap this up and we still have a little ways to go. So I'm sorry about that folks, but uh, and sorry Dylan. But uh, the, uh, one of the things that you have to consider is if I, was, if I was using a hanger harness, one of the things you have to consider is if I was using a tree saddle, some type of saddle where I'm hanging up in the, in the air, I'd have to position myself for the shot about right here. Right here, because the tree, the bow is going to hang on this side right here, and I'm going to have to hang for this perfect shot. What happens if it's over there? I either have to push myself away from the tree and try to position the bow against the tree and shoot that way, or what's more likely, I have to take my bow, move around and outside over here, and get a shot down here. Folks, that's why I would never allow a tree saddle on my property because it takes an easy shot like this. I can move 180 degrees, limits me to 90 to 110 degrees without moving much. And then I have to move around the tree and guess what? Most situations that mature buck that we're after, we're after five and a half, six and a half year old bucks, four year olds that, that don't take any nonsense, they're gonna be gone. And that's the bottom line. And so the tree saddles have a great place. You know, if you're running gun public land hunters, like the hunting public guys, awesome tactic. There's a lot of trees you can't use, but if we're using a tree stand setup on private land like this, and we expect close quarter shooting on mature bucks, we can't afford to spook them. Because even in a spot like this, you think, well, I have private land, you get chances all the, all the time. That's Kansas, Iowa. Not Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania. We get chances at a certain buck once a year, twice if we're lucky through a whole four month period, and that's it. So when we have that chance, we have to make sure that we take it and we can get it. Another thing too, I want to shoot seated, and I'll show you that in a little bit. What's the worst figure to a deer? It'd be a standing person like this. This is what spooks them, someone standing. When I'm sitting down, crouched down, that's not very alarming to a deer. You're just part of the tree at that point, but a standing figure? Now, let's say I'm standing out like this away from the tree. That's even worse, you're silhouetted. So again, I like hang-on stands. A ladder stand would be okay in this situation. I like hang-ons with a ladder. Um, that's what's gonna kill me the highest percentage of bucks over time, and I can't afford to make mistakes. We work too hard at this. I'm not just playing around out here. I wanna have fun with my passion. I wanna be successful. And when the moment of truth arrives, I need to get a shot off, one shot. Maybe I can mess up a shot. I actually don't even remember the last time I spoke to deer when I was gonna take a shot. It's been couple decades, 15 years, 20 years, out of all the deer I shoot, and I shoot several a year, I don't mess up because you're not moving that much in the tree to take a shot. And let's go up top and I'll show you some of those other factors for tree stand setup. Once again, down here, position of the stand, I wanna shoot down to the left. I'm in that sweet spot of what I feel comfortable with. Maybe you feel comfortable at 17 yards. Maybe someone else feels comfortable at 28, whatever it is, your comfort range, you're setting up. I know people with crossbow that might feel comfortable at 30, 35. Whatever your comfort range is, that's great. And then every time we set that up, we have mock scrape, trail camera, and tree stand, not necessarily a water hole. So let's put the hanger harness on, climb up real quick. We'll show you that bend as we're going up. And I'm gonna sit up there and show you some of the key points when we're in the stand and for this tree stand setup to make sure you get a shot this fall. Now we're connected 
and I'm about ready to climb. Very, very important. I have a bow roll hanging right here. That's what we'll use to hang out, pull the bow up with once we get up in the stand. I want to be able to come in as quickly as possible. I want to come in, attach my bow right here. I don't want to change clothes, put other clothes on, get something out to climb with. I want to hook on, put my bow there and get right up in the tree. The longer I sit here, the more chance I've spoken to that buck that I'm after. And then he's not coming back for two or three weeks or more. Probably for the season, I'm not gonna get a chance at him. It's that critical, that's the way I look at it. At the same time, if I'm changing clothes right here, even on a hour, over an hour walk in on public land, we have 45 minute walks in on private land in Wisconsin was, is one of our biggest. We have some half hour walks into Minnesota here. So you can get sweated up, up and down steep terrain, three to 400, even 500 foot change in elevation from between Minnesota and Wisconsin. Last thing I wanna do, take off my boots, stand on a little pad of scent here and leaves and debris and leave this giant scent wick all around here that a mature buck, wise old doe, could smell for five, six hours later. So I'm going straight up in the tree. I don't have time to fiddle faddle around. If it takes me 10 minutes to get a stand out, and this is on private land. You know, public land, we can spook out a spot and we just go somewhere else. So we can have multiple spots. That's a great thing about public land. Last time in, in Shawnee State Forest down in uh, Ohio when I hunted, we had six or seven spots that were all a quarter mile, half mile apart. And if we spooked out one, we could go to another one. We had cameras in each spot to monitor the deer. We could figure out what was going on over a broad area. Half mile away around here is another 160 acres, a half mile away. So we can't afford to have, unless we have a thousand acres or more, for all these spots we can spook out. So I wanna get here and get up, not leave any scent, and I don't want deer to see me down here. And let's go ahead and climb the tree. Okay, now I'm sitting this way, and this way represents the furthest way that I'm gonna shoot over to my right, I could probably shoot a little bit more just to the left of the camera. I'd probably shoot a little bit more this way if I was taking a shot at a deer, you know, right down here. My shot is right here, that's in my wheelhouse. I have a branch right here that I can hang my bow on. It's actually a perfect height. I actually plan with it from where the seat is because I want my bow to hang, my, that means my grip is about right here. That means if there's a deer coming in on this and I'm watching them come through and I have shooting, a shooting hole, window right here, window right there, then if I see them coming over my left shoulder, I can just simply take the grip, put my release on. All I have to do to move and take a shot is literally grab the handle right here, put my release on, I gently push it off there as it's coming. I'm pulling back and I'm shooting right here, here, here. I have a huge window I can shoot in. Now, if he's coming from that way, I can shoot all the way back here at this angle, just from the same seated position. Where's my back? It's against a tree. It's part of the tree. Now, my leg's sticking out, my arm, but I blend in to this tree, and I can shoot a 180 degree window just simply by doing this. Very, very slight movements. I'm seeing that buck, and I talk about the 10 second rule often. I'm seeing that buck, Okay, he's a shooter. You need to pick that up in one, two, three seconds at the most. This isn't food plot hunting. We don't, we don't normally do that. I think I sat on a food plot once with a bow last year, at least in a blind, that kind of setup where we can move around a little bit. So I figure a deer's coming through this location. I have about 10 seconds. That means I need to pick him up, know he's a shooter in two or three seconds. I need to put the release on the string, grab the bow, get it off, pull it back by six, seven, eight seconds. I need to follow him. I need to make the shot. That's all you have when it comes to mature bucks. I can think of the mature bucks that I've shot over the last 25 years, 30 years, and that's about all the time they give you is eight, 10, 12, 15 seconds by and large, some of them less, where you have to pick up that buck. So I don't have time to, to like I say, fiddle faddle around. I have to get that shot off quickly. That means I wanna stay in a seated position. Watch how much movement that is. I see a buck come in, I go to stand up to take the shot. That much movement right there is gonna lose a high percentage of your, let's say you lose 20% of all the deer you ever shoot at because you have to stand up. Now let's say I'm standing and I'm standing here. Now I can stand with my back against the tree. I can blend in pretty well, but not very comfortable. I plan on sitting on a rut hunt, morning hunt. I might sit here for six, seven hours. I can't just sit here. What do you end up doing when you're, when you're standing? You end up going like this. What happens when you hear something? Your whole body moves. So just, just standing like this, even though your back's against a tree, you're gonna move a lot less, or move a lot more, and it's very uncomfortable. When it's cold, you're exposing more of your extremities when you're standing up. 
I want to sit down in a nice quiet tree stand and I want to be able to huddle in if I'm cold. I want to be able to just sit just like this. I put my hands in my hand warmer tube. I have the tree hanging from the, from the branch. And if I don't have a branch, I use a screw-in screw bow holder. We have in all trees, unless we have branches, and we put it right about that same height so we can just simply pull back and shoot. Now, if there's a deer over there, if he's walking side to side, I wait till he gets behind a, a tree or something, I'll stand up, my bow's right here, and I can just turn and I can shoot him right down there. So pretty easy to do and I can shoot him behind us. So really with not much movement at all, I can shoot 270 degrees. I don't have to move away from the tree. I don't have to profile my, myself, my body outside of the tree to a deer. I can be very stealthy. I've shot deer behind me. It doesn't always work out. So you always have to plan for that. But if you're planning for 180 degree movement, your shot's right in the middle, your stand's this way. I think that's why I have a stiff neck over here all the time because I'm always looking like this if that deer's coming from behind me because I'm always angled to the right a little bit as a right-handed shooter. I can always tell when I go to a client property if they're left-handed, right-handed just by looking at their stands because most people, if the shot's there, you're not facing right there. It's gonna be very difficult to get the shot off. So once we're up here, again, spot tang your bow just off your left side or your right side depending on if you're left-handed or right-handed. And I want to be able, again, I want to be able to have my bow right here. Simply all I have to do, now in the past even, I put my cam right here. I don't necessarily advise that. I've only had a uh, bow fall once out of the tree and it's been since about 1996. But um, Dylan's probably thought it was kind of sketchy at times. But uh, Dylan, have you ever seen me drop a bow? I wasn't there, but yeah, <laughs> I heard about it. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, it uh, doesn't happen very often. It, it, even then, it's not probably recommended, but I'll put the cam right there, lean the bow back in between my legs, but then you still have to reach down, grab the handle and pull it up. I really like when it's hanging right in front of my face. Allows you to keep your hands free. And there's a little fawn right below me. Probably think I'm its mother, I don't know, but it's literally right below me. Did you get him, Dylan? Maybe I should talk more out in the woods while we're hunting, Dylan. They just come right in. Tell them to be back here in four and a half years. Yeah. We'll nickname him Boone. He'll be back here in four or five years. He's been around here a lot. This is like his little spot or her little spot. But I hope that makes sense. You know, we're really trying to, what's interesting, I come up to a spot like this. I can't wait to sit here. And, uh, and really the next time I come up here will probably be that during that moment of truth, we'll, we'll see by tracks and sign Maybe a trail cam picture or two. There's a nice buck coming in here. It might be end of September. It might be mid-October. I never wait till the rut. You know, good property, you should be able to hunt as soon as your bow season begins. The bad ones, you have to wait till the rut. You should never have to do that. Um, a lot of times you're just hunting leftover bucks by then if you wait till November 6th, November 7th, because the good hunters are out in the woods. I, I know someone in Coon Valley, they look at it like if you're, if you're shooting your bucks in November, you're cheating meaning you had a whole month and a half in the case of Wisconsin to figure it out by then, how come you didn't? But bottom line is if I, if I know they're hitting the, these stand locations in and around daylight, I wanna be out there. And I wanna make sure I have a stand location that's not only safe, I have a lifeline, easy to get into, get out of it safe. You can notice this ladder even right back here comes up above the stand location. So we're typically going up, we're about 20 feet high on average. A lot of people ask that, I would say, I'm more often at 18 feet than I am at 21 feet or 22 feet, but I'm right around that mark. I've spent a lot of time at 24, 25 feet up. We used to use 14 tree steps to get up in a tree. There are times where I'd have 50 setups out in the woods at one time, all those tree steps, and that's about what it was. It equal about 24 to 25 feet up. And uh, I just don't think you need to be up that. We have a lot of branches surrounding us, good backdrop. You don't want to be silhouetted outside your tree. You want to have, does it make sense trees behind you are more important than cover in front of you because your backlit, your, your silhouette's hidden, get away with a little movement. But again, when that moment of truth arrives, I might not make the best shot. That's something that, you know, we all have a failure rate on. I might sit here and never see that buck that I want. The hardest thing to get is a buck right down there in our shooting window so that we can take a shot. Don't let the hardest thing you do all year be actually taking the shot getting your bow and your handle. Don't have your bow hanging back here. Because if your bow is hanging back here and you have to reach around for it, it's too much movement, it's too much time. I've hunted with a friend that had a monster walk through. Bow is back here, 
he couldn't reach for it and bring it around and shoot in the time frame of the buck just walking through at a natural pace, wasn't running or anything. I typically stop them if I can, just make a little noise and stop them. Sometimes you can't, they're close, they're only 12 yards away and it's a gentle walk. I need to determine when exactly the arrow goes off too. I can't use a push-pull pressure back tension release like I do for target indoor and outdoor 3D. I can't use that push-pull and not know and have a surprise release because I need to determine exactly when that bow goes off and exactly the best shot. And that's why I use a trigger finger release, whether it's a wrist strap or a grip, and I just squeeze it slow like I would, would a gun, keep pushing and pulling, which that back tension in the off season teaches you. And then I determine exactly where I wanna take that shot down there by when the buck gives me a great, great shot. So tree stand set up, of course it's about safety. Of course it's about being in the right spot. We're setting up our stand locations in areas we expect to shoot bucks in the fall, not where they're at during the summer. But a lot of times it boils down to, I wanna make sure with whatever tree stand I'm using, with whatever setup I have that I can actually get the shot off because it's set up well ahead of time, months in advance to make sure when the moment of truth arrives, I can easily get a shot off with very minimal movement, a very, very low spook percentage. I don't have to move, I don't have to push away from the tree and I can get that shot when it comes time this fall and every fall. Been doing it this way for decades and it works. Always get the shot off, always make a good shot. You know, of course, practice with your bow and everything, but this tree set, set up and these rules are very critical to your success this fall.